I was in Washington with my family and we decided to volunteer for an organization called We Are Family which provides services to the elderly and we uh, visited with uh, this one woman who was over 90 and unable to leave her house and she asked me what I did and I said I'm a singer-songwriter and she said, oh, I don't get to hear live music anymore. The next time you come to Washington, you have to do a concert for me in my living room. And I realized in that moment how many people love live music and don't have the opportunity to hear it. We play free concerts in supportive housing communities, we play for veterans, we play at homes for people living with HIV AIDS, and also at homes for people with mental and physical disabilities. We also play for neighborhood groups that specifically support women in need. The home tour, I think, it gave us a chance to have residents experience live music, to, to be moved by that music, um, and to feel joy and just have that, that uh, opportunity. Sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. What's great about having on-site performances, I think for many of our residents, the fact that music comes to them imparts the idea that this is their community, that they're no longer outcasts. There were a couple moments where a camera was set up on the band and I looked at the audience and I found them so inspiring that I would just turn the camera around. It's not the way you keep me under your sweet cover on a dark and rainy day. It's that thing you do to me. Oh, that thing you do to me. One of the wonderful things about doing these shows and looking back is seeing how differently people experience music and also seeing how healing it can be for people to take a break from the struggle of their day-to-day -day lives. We also invite residents uh, to perform with us. We've learned that there are so many places that people call home. Every moment is such a joy, and there's never a dull day on the home tour. So you've been here a week in Connecticut, you've been doing the home tour and working with um, young adults. Uh, we'd love to hear more about that. Tell sure. us about those um, programs. I started um, working on the home tour in Connecticut uh, two years ago. Um, I was very fortunate to have been introduced to a lot of people here in New Haven and throughout the state um, by Mary Dale DeVore, um, who is at CMHC now. And she introduced me to Bob Cole, who is um, I think the best person to know in New Haven. Um, he introduced me to everyone I know. Um, and so I came up here, um, as I do in any new community for me, um, fairly humbled by the fact that I, I didn't know a lot of people here. And um, my interest was in, in navigating the mental health community and figuring out 
how the home tour could be applied specifically to mental health. We had been working primarily in supportive housing, which obviously there's a huge percentage of people living with mental illness living in supportive housing. So there was a crossover. Um, but when I came here, um, I met with Bob and Mary Dale, and, and we came up with the idea that we would come up for 10 days and we would play um, a range of mental health facilities in coordination uh, with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, so they were very helpful in figuring out the places where we would go. Um, one of the core parts of the tour here in Connecticut, um, and it's been really exciting for us this week, is to work with residents and clients um, and to encourage them to play for each other. I feel like the more we can have peer-to-peer -peer performances, um, the better. And so this week, um, that first tour we played all over the state. This week we've been focused a little bit more on New Haven, um, <coughs> partly because we're here for Art and Ide the Arts and Ideas Festival as well. Um, but we've played at Fellowship, West Haven VA, CMHC. We played at Connecticut Valley Hospital in, in Middletown and a, a range of other places, um, Yale New Haven. Um, and really, the, the highlight for us has been uh, going in and asking them to what interests them musically and asking them to sing for us. So I always say I want the home tour to feel, feel very loosey-goosey, but there's nothing loosey-goosey about it because I'm a Virgo. So <laughs> I go in and, you know, I, I always, it's, it's a little loosey, feels loosey-goosey for my band because I tell them they have seven new songs to learn within 10 minutes when people tell us what they want to sing. Um, but that has been the great, the great pleasure here. Um, I'll say just one anecdote. We played at West Haven VA last night. <laughs> Uh, we played there two years ago, and there's a, a wonderful um, guy there um, named Bobby Lee Highsmith, who I think has lived there for quite a while. And when we were here two years ago, he sang this amazing version of It Was a Very Good Year. Mm -hmm. And um, I told him, I, you know, we're just, you know, people are, are really struggling. And they enjoyed his performance so much. And so he apparently has been working since we were here last. He's been thinking about what his next song would be. <laughs> now we didn't come back sooner, you know. But um, two years later, he came up with a song. And he sang Stand By Me. And we had six other, six other residents at West Haven VA. So um, that's a sort of snapshot into what we're doing here. But it has been a, a remarkable partnership with Dimas. And, uh, and specifically uh, with CMHC, who have been such a ringleader for us. And speaking of that partnership, Commissioner, would you like to talk about the value of this program for your department and your clients that you serve? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're just thrilled uh, to, to have this partnership underway. And, and it really has been such a, um, so valuable for our, uh, for our clients, for our staff. Uh, Mary, you and your band really are working on bringing music into places where we really did, often don't have live music, and, and that's really a significant contribution for our folks. Um, it really helps to, or you've helped to, to transform spaces where people can sort of connect, clients and staff can sort of co co connect around the celebration of, of song and music, and, and that's really important for, for our clients and for our system. And so we're just thrilled um, about the collaboration um, the songwriting workshops that, uh, that you've done have just been tremendous for our folks and really provide a wonderful opportunity to, to be able to express all types of feelings and, and thoughts that um, at times can be dis difficult to express. And so I think just having the opportunity to, to sort of express those experiences in music and, and see a project to the end, um, to actually be able to perform is, is really uh, I think exciting for, for our young folks and for us as a system. So, so we're really thrilled about the collaboration. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the songwriting project, could you talk about that a little bit more, like what that entails? To sure. Be, um, we, two years ago, uh, we started working with the Young Adult Program um, here, which is, which is part of um, DEMAS and related to uh, CMHC. And I work with um, young people who are between 18 and 25. Um, who, many of whom have gone through the child welfare system, um, all of whom are, or most of whom are struggling um, from a dual diagnosis. So they're, they have some type of mental mm -hmm. illness, many have addiction problems, um, but they are, I have to say that it has been really an incredible experience working with them because I was, I was saying to someone yesterday that one thing that this particular group does so well is they tell their stories so well. Um, I think if you ask any you know, random 20-year-old, what's your story? 
I don't know that they would know exactly what that meant. Um, but for this group, they've been in clinical settings, um, and they have um, there's real value in telling your story. And so that's what we do with songwriting. I work uh, with my band, who are all here today, um, and we uh, we ask them to tell their stories, and they can pick one specific thing. They can talk about a, a larger, um, you know, their larger life story, and then we throw it out to a larger group, and we talk about what is universal, what's poignant to a larger audience. Uh, we ask them to pick a genre, style of music. Um, I always am hoping they'll pick country rock. <laughs> it's easier for me to play. <laughs> but some of them pick techno, some are hip hop. You know, we're we're getting better at all of them. Um, but the nice thing is, we are. You know, our our goal with the young adults is to give them a sense of completion, mm -hmm. as the commissioner said, and to have them have a sense of competency at the end of the day. Um, and I think. You know, that is, for anyone, you know, and I know anyone who's tried to write a song here, for anyone to finish a song um, is an incredible achievement. To finish a song when you're dealing with attention issues, when you're dealing with lots of different issues, and when your story and your, um, is very painful in some ways, is really a significant achievement. And I have to say that the pleasure for me has been listening to these songs and realizing that they could stand on their own in any club in America. Um, so it's not just an exercise. Um, it's really a, a creative achievement as well. And we're thrilled that tonight um, on the green we have um, two of the participants of our songwriting uh, workshops who are going to perform with us. And we are actually singing one of the songs that they've written. So you'll hear that tonight. That's great. Commissioner, do you have anything to add to that? or? Yeah, I mean, I just think that that's a wonderful opportunity for our folks to be able to go through that process of, of writing a song, but then to actually be able to perform it at one of our major festivals here in New Haven. I mean, the International Festival of Arts and Ideas is, is, is really historic here in New Haven. So just to have that um, opportunity, I think, is just really empowering for folks. Right. And so mm -hmm. we, we love that, that right. they're able to do that this evening right. with you. That's great. So Rick, so you're a writer of novels and song. So can you speak to the difference in each creative process? And then also, I know that you play, right? So I'm interested in knowing if the experience is, is therapeutic for you and how. Um, I was sort of thinking about why I was here. And, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And it goes exactly to the point that you're asking about, Lynn. Um, I mean, for me, watching this video and seeing what Mary has done to the degree that I have, um, the question that I, I mean, it's incredibly poignant and incredibly moving. And the question for me as a working artist is, why is music the form that this is so, that's most effective for doing this kind of thing, you know? And it answers your question like this. So when I write a novel, what I mostly do is I sit alone by myself. And I even kick my wife out of the room, and I make sure that the dishwasher is full and the carpet is spotless, and I disallow anyone to talk to me while I'm doing it. And it's great for novel writing, and it's not very effective for mental health. Mm. And, uh, right. and so right. given that that's the case, what can I do with my rare off times that serves as a corrective, you know? And what I found it, over the years is that the thing that really enables me to feel back in the world and connected to other people is to try to play music with other people, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a community building aspect to um, uh, playing a song with someone else or writing a song with someone else or singing with someone else um, that in my experience happens with no other art form, you know? In order to make a song really happen, unless you're an incredibly gifted solo performer, you need to play with other people, you know? And, uh, and for me, so much emotion gets released in that collaborative setting, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can see it here with these incredible mm -hmm. performances of the, uh, the extras, the non-band members who are singing <laughs> these incredible, incredible uh, uh, songs that they've worked on. So for me, that's why I do both. I do the music as an escape, a, a steam release valve from the hothouse of novel writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and I do it because I want what they got up there. I want that ecstatic moment. Great, thank you. How is that, that connection to community, Mary? You must feel it when you're performing. Could you talk about that a little bit, elaborate on that a little bit, sure. and what that's like for you? For you? Um, you know, it's interesting. When I started the tour, um, I was telling um, Dr. Sledge this earlier, when I started the tour, um, I, would, I called all these supportive housing communities in different places, and I said, I want to come in and do a concert, and they're slightly baffled, and because they hadn't done concerts. And, one of the important things for me was that I wasn't creating more work uh, for all these places we were going. You know, I come from a very long line of non-profiteers, and so I'm very mindful of people being overstaffed and understaffed. And so I said, if this, if this will help you build community, not in just this sort of buzzword kind of way, but if it truly will, and if we can provide some kind of support to your core mission, um, then, then we really would like to do this. And so people in, in the supportive housing community and now really in the mental health community came back and they said, you know, we have these common spaces that are often built into uh, these buildings that are built and they're, they're not used as much as we would like. And if you can create some kind of event that will bring people together in the most basic way, then that will, um, that will be a success for us. And so that has really been our goal, is to be on site. Audiences to come to us and putting the burden on ourselves to go to them. And that model has really worked because I think, um, you know, going to where people live, especially when they're not exactly where they want to be at that particular moment, and validating where they are and saying, you know what, you're here for a, a period of time, you may be in supportive housing, you may be in a, a mental health facility for a period of time, but wherever you are right now, um, you still have the right to take a pause and to um, have a good time. And I think the simplicity of our mission has allowed us to, um, to bring communities together. Because we're not asking them to come to a financial literacy class or a parenting class. Or, you know, which all of that stuff is really important in terms of people getting back on their feet. But I also think what it does is it, is it constantly reinforces their deficiencies and mm. makes them feel like, oh, I'm not quite there with this. But you know what? Everyone is there with having a good time and being there with their families, and specifically for women with kids who have been separated from their kids, um, people who have been estranged from their families, to create community events where they can be there with their families, they can perform for them, they can be validated in that way by their peers, and for people who have um, you know, not seen them in a while, I think that's, that's really the strength of, of what we do is that is that peer-to-peer -peer model. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, how about for your the people, the, your clients, um, the sense of community that they get from this program? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we've seen just this week alone, you know, throughout the the, the range of places that you've um, performed at that that the your, your band it you really transform the space and it helps to form community uh, among the our clients who attend as well as our staff. And and I think that that is. Um, it's healing. Um, it's a celebration of, of your music. Of, of folks are able to um, express and experience a range of different emotions. And so I think that that, that alone is, is connecting and helps to create community. Um, particularly because, you know, as, as we've talked about already, oftentimes um, our folks don't get to experience live, um, live bands or live concerts. And so it, it really does help to um, bring them together around just that, a celebration of, of, of music and and, uh, and being together. Uh, and again, across clients and staff, because for many of the events all week long, um, community members have attended, staff, clients, and, and it really has been quite a, um, a, quite a, a community or a, a atmosphere. Great, so this is really could be a question for all of you if you wanna answer it, but so I think we all have like that moment when we realize that music is, can be solace, can heal, um, could, could each of you recall the first time you realized that? Who 
Who wants to start? Start. <laughs> Who wants to start? Yeah, go for it. Go. <laughs> yeah. go ahead, Rick. Why don't you start? Go ahead. Um, I mean, I always think of two moments, and they're both roughly coterminous. My parents were divorcing in 1969, so I was eight, I guess. And they had just bought this big, fancy, hi-fi console. It was like the size of a large casket. And, As they were then. Yeah, yeah, and had a big turntable. That's the, you put a record on. Yeah. And, uh, and um, you know, my mother, who was a classical music person, nonetheless had this little pop music aspect to her taste. And uh, she had gotten two albums when they purchased the Hi-Fi Coffin. And those two albums were, were Abbey Road by the Beatles oh, okay. and uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water by mm. Simon and Garfunkel. And uh, so the soundtrack to my parents shutting the door in the living room so they could go in there and hash out their Mexican divorce and uh, child visitation and everything were those songs from those two records because I just remember dancing around in that room to, um, you know, uh, come together and songs like that. And so the absolute pinnacle for me of those albums was the song by the Beatles, Golden Slumbers. You probably know it, Mary. Golden slumbers fill your eyes. It's a lullaby that Paul wrote. Mm. And uh, so it's the soundtrack to my family sort of being atomized by the sexual revolution and stuff. And ever after that, I come back to that <laughs> song and it's, you know, it salves the, the ache. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, <laughs> actually, remember we? I remember there was there's always music in in uh, my house growing up. We also had one of those. I'm dating myself. One of those coffin term tables, <laughs> and uh, and so I think music has always really been a part of my life. My my, I played the flute. Uh, my brother played the piano, and so it, it's really always been a part of my um, life. I I don't think I realized the consciously sort of realize the healing sort of qualities of it um, until grad school, really. Um, I remember I'd had um, a, a, abdominal, abdominal surgery. It wasn't, wasn't very serious, but just had uh, surgery. And I remember it was so hard even to sit up or move around. And, and I remember my friends sort of, I was, wasn't even supposed to be in a car yet, but they came and picked me up and, and brought me to this drum circle uh, that was uh, happening at this cafe uh, right in right in the middle, like Purdue University. So that's where I did my grad school, and and uh, and I remember just sort of drumming. It was the first time I sort of drummed in a drum circle, and just getting sort of lost in the lost in the beat. It was amazing. It was it was uh, when we got there early, and so there were probably six people by the time we got there. But by the end of the drum circle, it was. There were easily 30 or more people, and there were bagpipes and um, didgeridoos and um, all types of instruments, and it truly felt like community, and, and it felt healing. And, uh, and I often say that drum circle got me through grad school, because <laughs> 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 we, we met there at that cafe like every Sunday, and we would just jam for like two or three hours, and at one point we got a request to do a wedding. And, uh, we wow. didn't do it, but because uh, <laughs> I can't imagine what the first dance song would have, or what that would have been like. But uh, but anyway, that that felt. I think it was at that point that I realized that music can be quite healing. Um, so when I came here to to Yale, um, I did my internship uh, at CMHC and I did some work at Fellowship and did a drum circle at Fellowship for um, folks with expressive. Um, sort of challenges, and it, and it was wonderful. It, it truly was transformative in terms of um, the people who, who participated in that. Well, I, my um, first musical influence, I think, was secondhand. I was very um, fortunate in that my parents had great musical taste, and uh, they both went to LSU, um, and they would go every Thursday night to this club called the Yellow Slipper, in Baton Rouge, and uh, 
they would listen to everyone from Bobby Blue Bland to Elvis to Irma Thomas, mm. just all these old school rock and rollers and uh, soul singers. And uh, soon after uh, they were out of college and they had kids, they decided that you know they were worried they weren't going to have an adventurous life. And we as a family uh, moved into a Volkswagen camper and lived in that camper for two years. <laughs> and traveled all around, all around uh, the world. So touring comes to me naturally, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but we, it's funny. We were talking. I was talking to a psychiatrist this week about early attachment, and I said. I'm so lucky that my early attachment was to Elvis Presley, who my parents played constantly in my first couple of years of life. Um, so I grew up, you know, I just grew up with music. It was just such an integrated part of my life. My grandfather was a piano player in New Orleans, and uh, we all just played. And it was, um, it was a source of uh, getting through every day, not just, not just the tough days. Um, but I have to say, for me, um, the most the most poignant, obvious moments for me in, in seeing the healing power of music has not been on, on myself. It's been on the people that, that we play for. Um, we don't talk about it in this video, but um, after we started the home tour in 2010, uh, the State Department asked us to tour as cultural ambassadors, uh, which is felt like a very heady term to us at the time. Um, but it's been a wonderful experience because we've been able to tour in 25 countries in four years. Um, but we played, I think the, the one moment, and I always remember this moment, is we were playing in, uh, in northern Iraq, and um, we were in a senior center. And there was a woman who, it was, you know, they're all older. Um, everyone had some level of physical and mental disability. But this one woman had this strange skin texture, and we had a translator and I said to him, the translator, I said, what, um, you know, where is she coming from? Because most of these uh, women had come from outside of, of Baghdad. And so she asked this woman where she was from, and the woman said, I'm from the garbage. And I didn't really understand the answer, and the translator said that's what she meant, because she had been abandoned because of having a mental illness. And she had lived for over a year in this garbage dump in central Baghdad. And that's why she had been outside for most of this year. And so I told her, um, you know, I asked her, I said, do you like music? And she just had the sweetest spirit. And I taught her this background of this song that we always do. It's this old Willie Dixon soul, soon, soul tune. Um, and all that she had to sing was, oh, yeah. And so I taught it to her. <laughs> and then she kept practicing it. And we taught it to the rest of the group. And so we started this song as a full band. And she was amazing because she got, there were a lot of people in wheelchairs. She wasn't. And she was the ringleader in getting all of the people in wheelchairs out onto the dance floor and spinning them around and making sure that people couldn't see, could get up and dance. And I realized, you know, here is somebody who has struggled more than any, any of us, more than anyone I've ever seen, um, and is, you know, using this musical moment to bring people together. And um, so we, were, we left. Uh, I think my favorite moment ever on the road is when we were leaving uh, this place in Sadr City. And we had a lot of security. And you know it's kind of a fanfare to leave this place. But So we're getting out and going down the stairs. And I could hear this woman just singing that back up, those few notes, <laughs> over uh. and over again as we left. And um, you know we don't know where she is now. But I can say we, we all had a great day with her. Yeah, that's great. That's a wonderful story. Um, so Mary, I wanted to ask you, why are you doing this? I mean, it's incredible what you do. Mm. What made you decide to do this um, and commit yourself to you know, giving so many hours to connecting people to music this way? You know, I mean, the video, the interview and the video talks a little bit about it. Um, I, I was so lucky in that I had been on the road for 10 years. and. Um, we were, you know, just doing the grind, you know, <laughs> playing for empty clubs in Cleveland and the like, and <laughs> a lot of empty clubs in Cleveland. But um, I, you know, I didn't intend to, to make this shift. Um, but seeing these women that we were volunteering for in Washington and realizing just the incredible number of communities that feel invisible because no one goes to see them other than their clinicians, other than their caretakers, um, and realizing that they don't hear live music, which is just so profoundly different than hearing a record. Um, 
I had that kind of light bulb moment and I just realized that this was an insane way to be spending my time going around the country chasing audiences when there were people, you know, sitting and wanting wanting to hear live music. And in some ways it's about it was about our music. Um, so we you know, we thought I think our music will translate. You know, we play, someone said, what do you play? And I said, I hope we play fun music. I don't know, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> my description. I hope it's upbeat. Um, so when we did the tour, we started playing upbeat music. And then I realized, you know what, we really have to switch it up. Because people don't want to be cheered up. They, they want to connect with what they are going through, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of our kind of mainstay songs on our, our set right now is So Lonesome I Could Cry. Hank Williams tune, and um, so you know all of these, all of these choices musically have made a difference. But the pilot program we did in 2010, where we played in 40, um, we played 40 different centers, and my goal was to make sure that we weren't doing something that someone else was already doing effectively. And I realized that there there wasn't this model, and that there needed to be. So Connecticut is a model, and Commissioner, why, why do you think that music isn't used more often in places? You know, it, it's a good question, and uh, it, it's a good question. I think it, it's a missed opportunity when, when it's not used, and, and you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that, that we, um, as a system, really are, are embracing um, Mary, your work, and um, other areas in the system we have. Uh, we have one of our um, community providers that is doing, they're doing sound healing with uh, drumming and, and uh, healing bells and bowls. And, and so, um, so it, I mean, we know a lot of the research tells us that, that music is, um, is transformative and incredibly healing. And so it, it, it right. makes sense uh, to incorporate it into, um, into our, our services and into our, our approaches to care. Um, and so certainly moving forward, this is one of the areas that we're really looking to, to continue to uh, find innovative ways to collaborate, to expand, um, really system-wide. And so, um, so I, I think it, 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 it certainly makes sense, given what we know from the research out there about how um, music can help to uh, transform spaces and, and promote healing and, and wellness. And, mm -hmm. um, and it really is, it, it's, it's aligned with our... Um, our Demas vision and mission as well. I mean, music is um, is often a, can be a celebration, particularly when it brings people together and it, it helps um, people connect with feelings of hope and um, uh, and wellness and, and even more difficult feelings. And so, uh, so I think it's a, it's an opportunity for us to to uh, integrate uh, music uh, into into our service system in, in creative and innovative ways. So stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mary, I wanted to follow up one thing that you said. Um, do you tailor your music to specific audiences? In other words, like do you perform differently like at a VA than you would? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And why do. is that? Um, well, I'm sort of opposed to the concept of a set list anyway, which is helpful. It's the bane of the existence for my band. But um, I, you know, I think you don't know, you never know what people are going to respond to. Mm -hmm. um, and we play for such a range of audiences. So we'll generally do, um, you know, we have the slow, the mid-tempo, and the rockers. And so we'll sort of see where people land in the first couple of songs and follow up with that. I mean, we played last, and we were at the West Haven VA last night, we played um, some bedside concerts uh, for people who couldn't leave their room. And there was one guy who was... This was a very sweet man who's on his last legs, and I asked him, I said, well, what do you want to hear? You want to hear a rocker or a ballad? And he said, always upbeat, always upbeat. <laughs> and, um, and so we sang, you know, a rock and roll song, and he, he was closing his eyes while we were singing. At the end of it, he looked up, and he said, you took me to a different planet, and today that's a very good thing. And... You know, I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find that balance of allowing people to recognize where they are and connect with where they are right now, but also, as Rick was saying, to be able to escape uh, from where they are right now. So our song choices are, are heavily focused on that balance mm -hmm. and dynamic. Mm -hmm. Great. How about a song for us? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> 
That was a good transition. Wasn't that good? Really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I told the band my solo career is starting right now here at the. <laughs> yeah. So this um, the song I'm going to do is um, it's called Maybe I'm Dreaming, and um, it is uh, a new song. We just start getting ready to record it, and um, that's the introduction to that. Don't feel quite like myself today. I'm looking for someone to blame. I don't know if I should make that call Maybe it's just one of those days Maybe I'm down Maybe I'm dreaming My head held high My eyes on the ground Maybe I'm down Maybe I'm wondering why the morning sometimes knocks me down. Seasons change without warning. <laughs> you know, as a matter Thanks. of fact, um, the audience is welcome. If you have questions, um, there's two microphones um, at either end over here at the aisle. And um, if, you have a, if you have a question for anybody on the panel, you could just line up, and uh, we'd be happy to call on you, too, okay? I should have mentioned that before. Um, can I ask a question yes, of can. Mary? Absolutely. I was just thinking while you were performing, has the tour changed how you write a song when you go to write a song now? You know, the, doing the songwriting workshops um, has changed how I write a song. Um, it seems so simple when I'm explaining it to them. <laughs> you know, I, so I think I go, I use, we use a lot of those tools um, that we forget about. You know, I used to be, I used to write songs in Nashville when I first started out. And um, I would go down in, to Nashville for a week, and I'd be set up with these, you know, full-on hillbillies. And I was a closer, so my job was to help them finish the song. And I felt like then I really had songwriting chops in a way that once you get on the road, you don't write in that same regulated way. And um, so doing these workshops has, has helped. And in terms of content, we have a lot of other things that we now write about just from being on the road and traveling. So you're still a singer-songwriter in the sense that you're still expressing Mary, even though when you go out to do these shows, you have a very different mission from just expressing Mary. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, ultimately, you know, we're trying to connect. And so whether it's through a cover that we think is a, 
a smart choice for a song or that will resonate with them or whether it's my own music or whether it's a song that I wrote on a subway about somebody I saw that's much more of an empathetic approach to songwriting. Um, we do try and do songs that are, that are personal and will resonate. I wanted you to talk about your band a little bit. You mentioned yeah. them. I guess they're all in the back. They were supposed to sit They were the supposed front. to sit here, but of course they're <laughs> in the back. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, guys. to just talk about them, their commitment yeah. to this. Yeah, you know, I'm very lucky um, to have these guys. It's, uh, um, we have the longest standing member of the Mary Pride Band has been in the band for 14 years. Um, everyone else awesome. has been in, um, you know, they stick around. Um, you know, I, I am very grateful to them because I started the home tour with, with um, almost no support. Um, and I said to them, I said, you know, payoff comes in a lot of different ways, guys. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and they went along for the ride. And uh, that first tour especially where we were trying to figure out whether it, whether it was going to work and whether there was a need. It was, it was a grind for sure. Um, and I think I'm most grateful um, that... You know, when I'm sure you all know, especially people in clinical settings, when you're in tough spots where people are really struggling, um, you get better at it. Um, you know, we were the awkwardness when you that you feel when you go into a place uh, with people who are really struggling and suffering, and um, your skills at dealing with at, with people and coming up with a set list um, gets better. And I think as a band, we've, we've gotten better in these settings and figure out, have figured out what works. And they also learn, they know every song. I don't really understand how that's possible, but they can pick up any song very quickly. So last night when people just came up and wanted to sing something, they somehow picked it up very quickly. So great. Yeah. Okay. Hi, you have a question? Come on uh, up. Yes. The, the little bit that I've heard of your music, uh, touches me. It, it, it really does. And as a way of leading into my question, I, I would say that if you and your band were to play a polka or an oborek, it would touch <laughs> me as well in a different way. But it, it, um, when I was listening to when each of you realized what music can mean to you, um, for me, I was growing up in a, a rather um, single stream ethnic community. And we would hear the polkas and the obereks and, and the church music. And when you play for uh, elderly people, whether it's rest homes or wherever, I'm assuming that many of them, given their age, would have grown up similarly, uh, whether it's Italian or, or whatever. So when you go to these places, I'm wondering, um, you, you play music that you've written or that others have written, uh, 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 country music and so on. Are there times where you've um, also maybe tried to do a polka or an oborek or some other ethnic music as a way of connecting and feeling people connected with you? Um, I don't know if that can happen in, in the instrumentation that you have or the experience that you have, but uh, could you speak to that, please? Sure. Um, we do that internationally on a more regular basis. We always learn a song from wherever, um, wherever we are, so we've, we've got a, a great so I'm going to Urdu, if anyone wants to hear it. Um, but we, I have to say that we play in so many interesting communities. Um, oftentimes, that's a great opportunity for us to ask residents to play for us um, because we don't, you know, we don't know that particular style. But I did one show in L.A., which was one of my favorites, where it was a supportive housing building. Half of it was, were um, mostly Russian senior women, and the other were, was all gay men struggling with HIV. And so I was trying to figure out the program for the day. <laughs> so, wow. So it, was, it was wild. So we're in this courtyard in West Hollywood. And I just, you know, these Russian women got up and sang these Russian folk songs with just such huge aplomb. It was amazing. And, um, and then I had all these, these gay guys who wanted to sing full-on show tunes. I mean, boas, <laughs> costume changes, the whole thing. It was one of my most favorite days. And I just looked at the band. I was like, Can, you cannot invent this. You know, you go to where people live in these situations, and that happens. Um, 
But we are, you know, we are, I wish we could more than, more than we do come up with those songs, those other different styles very quickly. Uh, but we're lucky in our, in our international travels, we usually have opening acts. Um, so we were, we were in Haiti a couple weeks ago and uh, our la one of our last shows, we had this incredible compa band play with us and then we got to play with them. So um, we're lucky and we get a lot of uh, exposure to a lot of different styles of music. But your point about how people, um, like what people, what resonates with them, you know, with the vets, it's always very, it's pretty specific. You know, we get a lot of requests for Chris Christopherson. Mm. And um, <laughs> one guy two years ago in Connecticut asked us to play a Chris Christopherson song, which I didn't know. And he was also on his last legs. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know the song. <laughs> it's his request. And so I said to the band, I was like, Google the song. We need to play the song. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think you were next. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wonder if you help other people write music because I saw a play recently uh, where a, a teenager and you know a couple of teenagers who have teenage angst also had pain, and there was a music therapist who came and he put their words, she put their words to music. And I wonder if you do that and what your experience is with that. Sure, we do that um, in Connecticut with the um, Young Adult Services Program. And we do that on a regular basis. Um, so that's been a, a big, pretty significant part of our, of our work here. And what's your experience? You know, one of the first bigger groups we had, one of my favorite, um, young people we worked with was this um, young woman who was, who was blind. And so we're throwing ideas out there saying, what do you want to talk about? What's your, you know, what's your topic? And um, you know, I'm, of course, hoping she's going to write this incredibly poignant song about being blind. And she said, no, I want to write about elephants. It's like, OK. So <laughs> she wrote, we started writing the song about elephants. And then she backtracked. And she said, you know what? I, I should talk about the fact that I can't see. I said, well, OK. And so she, she said it was all her idea. She said, I want to talk about the things that I remember. And so she made a list of all of the things that she remembered from when she could see, because she didn't lose her sight until she was 12. Mm -hmm. And so she made a list of how, wow. like, descriptions of her parents' faces and vacations they went on. And, um, and that was a, you know, getting to the heart of someone's experience was really important. Um, and that's, that's what we try and do in those workshops. Hi, you have a question? Hi. What a wonderful model. I was just thinking about other local bands in Connecticut that mm -hmm. could also learn from you and, and how you do your songwriting workshops and that they could be doing these home tours on a more regular basis. Is that going on right now? Mm -hmm. um, we are, um, right now we're expanding the home tour. So um, the, since the Mary McBride Band is an entirely sustainable model, <laughs> Um, we are um, reaching out. We're going to create an you know, artist committee for you know, and and try and, and can, the next time we come to Connecticut, we'll have a lot of local bands. Um, but we're also expanding the home tour in 18 states between now and 2016. So um, we are, you know, it's really going to end up hopefully being the home tour festival, where we come back and we have multiple bands going at multiple times. I think in. in order to be able to multiply the impact of what we're doing, that's going to be a, an integrated part of it. Hi. Hi, I have a comment and a question. Um, yesterday, I was listening to NPR, and they uh, reported on a study that a number of pediatricians at some hospital had done. And um, what they had come up with um, was in the pediatric wards, they took some kids and read to them, and some kids got to listen to music. And they found that they, their pain was reduced when they listened to music, but not when they were read to. So uh, they're That's trying to. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Another thing, I guess, alone. But but it's, it, you know that music really. Mm does have a, a healing effect and they can and they're very excited about it because painkillers can have a lot of side effects especially for young children and so by reducing the amount of medication that they can give for you know to, that they have to give for to to make the pain at a reasonable 
level will be very helpful for these children. So my question is, given that music is a healing art um, and is applicable to everybody, everybody um, benefits from it, um, would you, commissioner, go to the Department of Education's commissioner and try to get them to make music part, especially of elementary school, where we have a lot of kids who do come from troubled homes or have difficulties, middle school where they're, you know, having trouble just being human beings at this at that point. No. You know, music could really help a great deal, and what we're doing is cutting it out instead, and I think that's a major problem. Yeah, I mean, I think you raise a really good point, and, and we know that, uh, that in different programs across the country, music is, is at, at times being cut back, and so it is, it's definitely an area that, that continues um, to be an, an area of needs within, or an area of need within educational settings. Um, and so um, I can certainly mention it, but I, but I also urge you to, to, you know, to, to be empowered around mentioning it as well. Um, and, and uh, you know, get people together because I think there's power in numbers. And so the, the more people you can get to sort of resonate around that message, I think the, uh, the greater impact it will have. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, you have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm actually curious about the sort of the local resonances. Of, this is a Connecticut Festival, and this is a largely Connecticut-based panel. So Rick works at Yale and is from Connecticut, and Miriam obviously has roots here, and Lynn um, is has lived in the area and worked with these issues here for a really long time. And so I'm wondering if Mary could speak about what she's found, might be hard to do, but what you found in the new residencies specifically in Connecticut, mm -hmm. and maybe the other three can respond based on um, their own experiences here. Sure. Um, well, one of the things that was very um, was eye-opening for me and poignant for me is I was able to shadow the staff, both, both the vocational and, and psychiatric staff of the Young Adult Services Program. Um, and I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to do that because I didn't want these songwriting workshops I was doing to sort of feel like they were in a vacuum. And um, I have been... I was really impressed by the integration of that program and um, the effort to look at people living with mental illness in a, in a holistic way, you know, that you have to understand where they're living, understand how they're going to reintegrate into the workforce, how they're going to, you know, how my songwriting workshops are going to fit into that. Um, and so having that background has been very helpful in, to me in going into places like Fellowship Place which is a community center or, or more of the direct mental health facilities, and having a clear understanding of, of the range, huge range of backgrounds that people have um, before, they, before they get to these places. So um, it's not a music-specific answer, but I think it's, um, it's important um, for all of us, you know, whether we're advocating for more music programs, whether we're advocating for quicker change, you know, whether they're, however we're, um, advocating for, for systemic change in these areas to realize the inc how incredibly complicated it is. And I've, I've been privy to that, and I'm very appreciative of it. After you. You know, can you repeat the question again? Yeah. I just want to make sure I, I got it. I was just curious about Mary's experiences in Connecticut, both uh, you were speaking sort of about larger issues, but maybe also, like, the problems that people are dealing with and maybe the, the thoughts in response um, from the people that do live in Connecticut and have lived in Connecticut. Um, so. What's the Connecticut piece? That's what you're asking. Uh, yeah, Why Connecticut? if there is one, I don't know. I mean, I think Connecticut's a really sophisticated state. And so... What's exciting to me as a person who grew up here and is watching stuff like this happen in Connecticut is 
I mean, maybe this is a, a preening high self-regard moment, but <laughs> I can't imagine that this program would happen in, you know, uh, Arkansas in the same way, let's say. And I feel like part of the reason it can happen here is because, you know, the Northeast is, is used to being a laboratory for new ideas, you know. We've been around here longer than uh, this nation has been inhabited by the European interlopers, you know. We're the longest enduring population of European interlopers, et cetera. <laughs> and uh, so I feel like um, uh, it's a good place to try these kinds of things. And even when you're a kid growing up in Connecticut, and you feel like, I can't wait to get out of Connecticut. It's horrible. <laughs> it's a state that you drive through. You know, um, you realize that, you know, the kind of bedroom community model of Connecticut or the local community model of Connecticut is also what makes it so exciting. It's so diverse. There are so many people here uh, and from so many different walks of life and so on that an experiment like Mary's can really take root. I was thinking, you know, the only other comparable thing I know from recent music history that's similar is when Jonathan Richmond dropped out of playing and just started taking his guitar and going to, like, um, hotel lobbies and VAs and stuff. Yeah. And that was in Maine, right? Yeah. So it was another state in New England, you know. I think, you know, we have a real... Um, uh, opportunity in a state like this to try these things out and see what sticks. I mean, I'm so excited to know that you're going to go national with it. We're it, going national. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it should. It should sure. go na <laughs> national. But I also feel like, you know, I think we do deserve a little pat on the back here in <laughs> the nutmeg state <laughs> for, uh, for uh, being willing to try stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think uh, in, in terms of Demas in our work, I mean, this really fits with our view and vision of recovery. And so I think it was a natural sort of fit and collaboration for us. Um, I mean, we really are about sort of promoting um, recovery-oriented um, care and systems and helping individuals to live full, whole lives in the community. Um, of, and, and full lives, whatever that means for them. And so... Uh, you know, in many ways, the, the, the work that, that, that Mary, you and your band are doing really in, helps to um, in, embody that. It's about sort of celebration and hope and, and uh, connection and wellness. Um, and, and our system is very much about that. So I think the, the alignment it was, is really natural. Uh, and, and so it, it makes sense for us. And, and I think it's important now. Um, because really, as a system, again, we're interested in exploring um, alternative and, and um, complementary approaches to health and healing. Um, because we know that that really helps to sort of round out, uh, you know, a person's, a person's life space. So. One of the things I wanted to add about um, just the study of music therapy and, um, and the sort of science of song that I think is really interesting is that there is now, you know, it used to be that music really relaxes you. Like, I find nothing relaxing about music. I find it sometimes. <laughs> you know, I, and I think that the, there's so many clear, specific research on the physiology of singing and, and music, and, the, and there are demonstrated effects in, um, in the clinical world about how music affects people who are in pain people who have mental illness, whatever that level of pain is. And I think as, that, as those studies become more so sophisticated and substantiated, uh, the easier it is going to be um, for musicians to integrate into, um, into a clinical practice. And um, that's been a, a great gift for me to be in the company of, of so many people at the School of Medicine and School of Psychiatry and CMHC. Um, to see those see those studies happening, um, and they're happening all over all over the world. And there's a wonderful book if you all are interested called The Science of Song by Elena Manis um, mm -hmm. that's really uh, worth reading about that subject. Great. Hi, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so I, when I was watching the video of the performances and listening to what you were talking about, I was thinking of it 
um, sort of in the context of my experience, which has been as a mental health practitioner with um, homeless adults who have severe mental illness. And my work was uh, mostly field-based, and I spent most of my time at places where um, homeless people congregate, if not necessarily live, and um, in encampments under bridges or in parks or in certain parking lots or different places, which is where I would work with them. And I was just wondering if you had ever played in a setting like at an encampment or somewhere else where um, people don't necessarily call home. Um, and if you had, if the idea of something like a home tour carries a different resonance or significance in a setting like that or in a population that doesn't necessarily even go to a facility or any sort of place like that to call home. Um, we have. Um, you know, there's a, there is a wonderful um, Maya Angelou quote uh, where she says, I long to feel at home wherever I find myself. And um, that is a real, um, is something I remind myself of. We were, we were ju just in Haiti, and um, I was meeting with Habitat for Humanity there, and they, they don't actually build houses there because there isn't really the infrastructure to build lasting houses, but they have these tent cities, um, and they're trying to solidify them. And that's one of the things we do internationally is we play, um, you know, we played in a, a refugee camp um, in northern Iraq for people who had, who had left Syria. That was very early on. Um, we've played um, a lot of different places where people just gather outside. We run the home tour in Seattle, um, and there's a lot of tent cities that have just sprung up in the middle of Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, those are exciting for us. I mean, our basic model is we don't go to short-term places, but in places where people have to create a home, very quickly and have to feel comfortable and for however long they're going to be there, I think music um, provides some solace and comfort. Hello. Hi. I'm a member of a fellowship and I, I can definitely attest to the fun time that we all had. So I strongly urge everybody to come to the green tonight at seven o'clock and bring some people because it will be a fun time uh, but my question is uh when i if i'm in a conversation with somebody and i tell them i have a mental illness there's a noticeable change quite often and i was wondering if or thankfully you play at fellowship but there's is there a possibility that we can bring the community in the surrounding fellowship or, or you know because like Fellowship is a, basically a campus. Um, it's a gated campus, so you, you, need a, you need a way to get in. But uh, we don't necessarily interact too much with the community surrounding us, um, but we are part of the community. So if there's a way to like, break down these barriers of, oh, that person's got mental illness, so we, you know, don't give him a gun because you know, bad things happen because he's got a mental illness, or she. So my question is, um, is it possible to involve the surrounding community of these places. I mean, I don't, it's not like I don't really want to give you more work, because I, <laughs> I think the work you do is really phenomenally great. Um, but the, the question is there, um, and it's some, it, it needs to be addressed by somebody, so. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we do in the structure of the home tour is we work with nonprofit partners like Fellowship Place, um, and we're very mindful that they have, they are better suited to figure out the the right formula, and so um, Mary Guerrero, who, who's an incredible person who runs Fellowship Place, you know, we, we give people the opportunity to invite the larger community, and um, we had an, an experience in uh, Portland where we played a supportive housing community, and they had a single singles building and a family building next door to each other, and neither, they had never combined an event, and for the first time they had those two buildings um, come to a home tour. So. You know, I think it's also fellowship is so is so uh, member driven um, that I think if, if that was something that you all wanted to do, that would be great. We love a big old hoot nanny, so <laughs> we're happy to uh, invite more people from larger community. I think it makes a lot of sense, and that's what we're trying to do with the New Haven Green show tonight, and um, is to really um, bring the young people we've been working with in a specific setting and bringing them into a just a public setting where we're not you know, acknowledging, um, you know, all of the nuances of our relationship. Great. 
Yeah. Commissioner, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I mean, and I think, you know, moving forward, I mean, we know that this is something that, that we see continuing, and, and we've, we've talked about that. And so, you know, I think there's opportunities to, to plan um, upcoming events in all kinds of ways to, to address um, just that question, sort of ways to bring, um, ways to create community and to create collab or, or to, to help foster creative collaborations. Um, and so it's something that we, sh we should keep in mind moving forward. I mean, who, who would we want to invite and, and maybe what, what might the venue be and, and what might the event look like? And, and I mean, there are all kinds of, I think, creative partnerships we can think about across sort of state and, and other community um, organizations even. And so, um, so, so we, should just, we should keep that on the table. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Hi, you have a question? Hi, my name's Matthew. I'm from Nashville. Moved here about a week ago, so I'm new oh, to New Haven. Welcome. <laughs> uh, and I'm an instrumentalist, a guitarist. Uh, however, I don't sing, or therefore I should say I don't sing. Are there opportunities, uh, since I have some free time at the moment, uh, just getting settled to this area, uh, to volunteer if you don't sing, <laughs> for example? Sure. Uh, or you play an instrument, but... Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a... That's definitely a need when we do our songwriting workshops, um, because we've got um, you know a lot of people who do who write lyrics, um, but then in just kind of coming up with structures for the songs and different grooves and uh, figuring out where those songs can go, that's very helpful. Um, you, you know, it's not performance based; it's really writing based. So I'd love to talk to you more about it. Yeah. Thank you. Same here. Same here. Uh, second question, if I may. Uh, you mentioned your experience with the blind, uh, the blind woman, uh, and I have a really strong passion uh, for working with the blind. You also mentioned Bob Cole, I think, as someone who's... Uh, it's Bob Cole. Raise your hand, Bob Cole. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just curious, to, since I'm new to the area, to find out who I might speak with. Uh, to, you don't need to know anyone else. You're, you're all speak set. to Bob Cole. Awesome. <laughs> I answered my question. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. So um, before we wrap up today, I was just wondering from each of you if there's something I didn't ask that you would like to talk about. I mean, I was thinking uh, the whole time today about what is the effect of what Mary's doing on music as a form. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obvious what, uh, you know, what the effect is on the community, but what happens to the art form when you do this to it? And I write about music a lot. I'm a music mm -hmm. critic occasionally. And my complaint about contemporary music is that digital music has re removed many of the nuances that I love about the art form mm -hmm. from it, mm -hmm. so that it's become you know, very homogenized and um, often predictable and so on. Mm -hmm. so, to me, it's not a coincidence that we're talking about live music here, mm -hmm. that it has to be live. In order for the community, uh, the community piece of this to really work, somebody's got to be in that room playing the music for somebody else. You know? mm -hmm. And you can see it up there when you know, supposed non-musicians, or let's say people who haven't sung in 20 years or something, are getting up in front of people and singing that your idea about what music is changes in that moment. You know, there's harmonic things that happen that would not happen in a, in a smoothly manufactured pop hit 2015. Mm. There are rhythmical things that are happening that are unusual. The music's unpredictable. It goes places that music doesn't necessarily go. And so for me, part of the service is to the form itself. Mm. You know, it looks like it's just a community thing. Like, hey, let's send this woman with the big heart out there to sing to all those people. It's not that. It's also doing something for what music is. Mm. And that's invaluable. Like, if we just continue, if our kids, thinking again about the education piece, only know music to be what's made on a laptop or in an expensive studio with digital recording, et cetera, they miss this old thing that music used to be, the performative thing. So I think on that basis, it's really important, too. Great. So great. That's a great comment. Yeah, 
my, uh, my thought on that, I was just thinking about our shows, um, my band will laugh about this, but um, how we go into these shows with a specific structure and, um, and they just never end up like that. And partly for the audiences we play for, you know, it might take them a little bit longer to get on the dance floor. Um, and it might take, you know, uh, one song might resonate more and suddenly people are moving slowly to whatever the dance floor looks like. You know, so I'll call for 12 solos in a row because <laughs> we're <laughs> feeding on that moment. Um, but I think it does change and just the, the feeling of being in the room is, um, is very different. And it's very hard to measure. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the hardest parts for the home tour is... Um, when people say, you know, how are you measuring your impact, which is a very, obviously, a foundation-driven um, question, I just say you need to come. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and once you come and once you feel it, it'll be a lot easier for us to have a realistic discussion about that. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, you know, I just would like to thank, thank Mary for being here with us this whole week and for touring uh, many of our uh, sites and for working with our folks. And, and it really has been uplifting um, for us everywhere. I mean, there are a couple shows that I, I many that I, weren't, I wasn't able to make it at, and, uh, and all I'm hearing is people talking about it. And so that's, that's wonderful. You know, our staff, is, as, as well as um, hearing that our clients really had a wonderful time. And so, and so that, this is a gift for us as a system, and so I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Great. And the band. And, and the, the band. band. Absolutely. And the Absolutely. Band. It's all. Bravo yeah. for the band. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I also like to thank Go ahead. I also just want to thank a, a few people. Um, I want to thank Dr. Sludge for introducing us. I always want someone from Alabama to introduce me from now on. It's such a great <laughs> voice. Um, I want to thank Tom McMahon um, and uh, Cheryl Jacques from the Young Adult Services Program. They've been amazing um, in my in helping me kind of integrate into into their program. And obviously Bob Cole and Mary Dale DeBoer and the Art and Ideas Festival. I mean, it's amazing to be here in this setting, uh, talking about what we're doing, and we're really excited about tonight. And thank you all very much for being with us here today. Yeah, thank Appreciate you for coming. That. What a great panel. Woo! Don't forget, 7 o'clock tonight on the New Haven Green. Thank you all. <laughs>